Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, friends and family beyond the binary, good evening and welcome to another edition of the CENC Southeast Invitational. Tonight we have two semifinal matches for you. The first one featuring a uh, school, one of the largest public schools in Georgia, Kennesaw State, taking on another school nestled in the mountains of North Carolina, Appalachian State. My name is Warren Juggle God Hammond and I am joined on the mic once again by Amentus. How are you doing tonight? <laughs> that they do, and I'm excited to see what's going to come out from both teams. Now, this is mine and your first time seeing Kennesaw State, but they are no stranger to this tournament or tournaments in general. Right now, they are uh, competing in several and uh, doing very well in all of them. As a matter of fact, they've gone undefeated in the Peach Belt Conference and uh, going to the playoffs next weekend in South Carolina. So Kennesaw State looking very good, but we know Appalachian State as well. A couple of members of their team from Best Buds, a contenders team that did very, very well uh, recently. Or open division, rather. Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. In their play from the beginning to the end of that series, the way that they were taking a lot of those... strategies that they can rely on and hopefully recreate as they did in the quarterfi quarterfinals rather to make it to the finals yeah that's a very good point you know um the uh, Kennesaw State they are very proficient on both a spam and rush composition so you know uh we haven't seen I really don't think Appalachian State go up against a spam composition yet so in the semifinals here tonight it'll be interesting to see how that plays out um it's going to be a new look coming up against them 
Absolutely. And I think, you know, obviously the quarterfinals is sort of that moment where you get to cut the wheat from the chaff, make sure that you really do get the best <laughs> of the best going into the rest of the tournament. And I think now in the semis, this is the best chance for all of these teams to really set themselves apart from the rest of the pack, especially considering mm -hmm. that this is the last barrier towards making that cash prize and coming away from this tournament with that concrete reward, let alone having the chance of going to the land. So again, Lots on the line for both of these teams, Kennesaw versus App State. Everybody in the server is going to be hungry for this dub, and I cannot wait to get into it. Neither can I. And just as a reminder, this is going to be a first to two matchup. We will be going to first to three for the finals, but uh, this is going to be first to two here. And we are going to start things out on Nepal. So uh, obviously going into this tournament, the format here is both of the teams get the opportunity to ban a couple of maps at the beginning mm -hmm. of the match to determine where we're going to start on control. And as we go to Nepal first, the first thing that enters my mind is adaptation. And again, this is the biggest you know buzzword that I can possibly use these days. Uh -huh. it feels like, But um, Nepal as a map in general lends itself to a lot of different play styles. You can come out on rush on reliably, I'd say, on I'd say two of the three sub maps we've got uh you know village shrine and in some you know rare cases i think the third sub map has rush playable as well but in general you can come out with whatever you feel comfortable with and uh here as we go towards village though i think this is very set in stone both of the teams going to be coming out with rush here Oh, yeah, I would be very surprised if we saw anything else. And that is exactly what we're seeing right now. Another interesting thing to note, both of these teams are actually playing with ringers, I believe, tonight. Each one uh, had a little bit of a problem finding one of their main starters. So we are going to see a couple of ringers, and, and it'll be curious to see how that affects each team as well. Um, but both teams, like you said, coming out on this rush composition and um, going to be looking to control this high ground first. Interesting. Interesting. So, so App State, State refuses to go to point first. This is going to allow Kennesaw to rotate, set up the, on the objective, get those Symmetra turrets in the right position, as well as being able to re-TP to get a new position should they choose to do so. But 10 seconds to the point on locks, they're going to play things a little bit conservatively, try to get that Sim charge going first. Yeah, they're just looking to get a little bit of charge. Just like you said, Maywall comes out though, and it's... Uh in its sections off listen and they are removed from the fight so now there's no way for appalachian state to push in or out quickly mortality field has to be used by madge but effortless is removed from the fight already as is nitro galaxy um and now kennesaw state able to just push forward take care of the rest of these staggers and secure their hold on point Prototyper is the mech, so they're going to have to jump off the map quickly to get that D.Va mech back. But again, Kennesaw just kind of takes it straight to the objective and has a much easier time with it. They get that sim charge going, and it's really easy to just stand and fire at everybody from App State that walks towards you. Great wall to open things up from Wads. They're going to have to recreate it as App State touches. Ooh, yeah. And uh, Shatter comes in from Dave. Doesn't catch anybody out there. Here comes the uh, freeze from Combat Wombat as much as they can to try and isolate some of those targets from Kennesaw, but they are unable to do that in uh, Amplification Matrix now used, and a wall is prompted in response from Lukewarm. But Kennesaw State still has control over this point with uh, almost 50% on the docket for them as well. A shatter Ooh. comes in from Nitro Galaxy, takes down two, Combat Wombat, listen, and both hit the ground, but Dave is the one who's looking a little worse for wear right now in Appalachian State. ISO hops the a sound barrier as well, but it's not going to be enough as the picks finally start coming through for Appalachian State, and they are going to be able to clean up the rest of these staggers and get their first capture here on the ball. So that was a very intriguing fight for me because you saw uh, throughout the duration of that, Kennesaw was in the driver's seat. You know, they had the objective control. They were making sure that App State had to come to them. But then they dropped that sound barrier and extend off the objective, which leaves them open to combat Wombat's Blizzard. So interesting decision from Kennesaw that ends up getting punished. And now App State has five ultimates on this recontest. However, Kennesaw does have the teleporter from the Symmetra to access that objective directly, which will allow them to get on that point very fast. Yeah, that's going to make sure that none of that chip damage comes in along the way. Uh, um, Deadeye committed from the Cowboy. Doesn't find anything but his prototyper with a self-destruct and Wads following up. That's going to allow Kennesaw State to reclaim this point and start to build percentage once again on the back of a few picks. 
they learn from their previous mistake. They're like, okay, let's not get off the point and just go straight there instead. It gives them a much easier time dealing with that wave of ultimates that comes over them. And now all that App State has left is this Earth Shatter from Dave. So if Nitro Galaxy's on point, this is looking easy for Kennesaw. Oh, 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 wow. And the Fire Strike through the Amplification Matrix catches out listening. Once again, Appalachian State is now crippled at the knees. They're not going to be able to push back and forth. And with so many picks coming in, it is almost a foregone conclusion that Kennesaw State is going to pick up this first map win. And uh, something that we're going to have to note is some of these tiny differences between the two compositions when we see mirrors like this. App State coming out of the gates with that uh, cowboy trying to take that high ground control. They were looking for a close range quick engage and Kennesaw never gave it to them. They made sure everything was on their own terms going as slowly as possible, trying to ramp up their damage and ultimates over time. And that never allowed App State to get that explosive fight that they wanted. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. And you know, moving moving into now Sanctum, I feel like Kennesaw State is looking very good. You know, uh, Appalachian State had a couple of good moments there, but Kennesaw, I believe, has really been in control for the most part in this series so far. But, you know, we've only seen one sub-map and anything can happen in Overwatch. Absolutely true, and already App State trying to make some quick changes. They're going towards this interesting six-man dive with a soldier in the mix, uh, relinquishing some of that early control, and that actually leaves their entire front line out to dry. This fight feels <laughs> like it's already over. Yeah, it certainly is. Those picks came in fast for Kennesaw State. Um, the push from Appalachian State was quick, but Kennesaw was ready for it, and they were ready to counter everything that they threw at them. Yeah, it was fast, but Kennesaw just got to the pillars first, which allows them to control the space. And I think that's going to be one of the stronger points of Kennesaw's brawl here. They know what they're doing in these team fights space ones. Yeah, they certainly do. Fight has broken out now in this entryway for Kennesaw State. A couple of picks coming in already. Glistening and Dave already down, and this fight is over almost before it starts. Once again, Nitro Galaxy getting very close to the Shatter as well on Kamski. Oh has Jeez. this amplification matrix online and look at how aggressive <laughs> Kennesaw is getting. They don't want Appalachian State to have any chance of making it out of their spawn. Oh, that has got to be demoralizing when the shatter comes out, doesn't even hit anybody and they, you know, still manage to easily win that team fight. I think App State is kind of struggling to find a foothold here after that first sub map loss, which is understandable. I think the rush was one of their stronger points in the previous match. And now that it's not working immediately, you might start to see them crumble slightly. But again, they have to figure out something. This is their last chance. Yeah, it certainly is. Um, and with 50% on the clock, they are definitely looking a little bit desperate right now. Appalachian State really needs to get something going, and that's going to do it. Effortless comes out with a pick onto Nitro Galaxy. Without that main tank, Kennesaw State forced to back up a quite a bit. Wads does get a counter pick, though, and Dave is removed from the fight as well. So, Kennesaw State, despite losing their main tank, they have managed to turn things around and send Appalachian State back to spawn once again. It does feel like Kennesaw consistently has some kind of idea going into these team fights. They're saying, okay, we're going to try to do this at the very least. Whereas it feels like when I'm watching App State play, we're kind of throwing all six members directly at the first thing they see and just hoping it sticks. That fight, they get the opening pick onto Nitro Galaxy, but they can't rotate it into any further success. And now look at this aggressive bomb from the two tanks of Kennesaw. It kills wow. the Baptiste. Are you kidding me? Oh my gosh, that was an interesting play right there. Not only was it the... the self-destruct coming in from Potertyper, but that charge as well. I was worried it was going to leave Nitro Galaxy out to dry, but <laughs> it doesn't look like that's the case. And what a charge coming in from Dave. Finds Lukewarm on the flank, but the picks are still coming in heavily in favor of Kennesaw State. And without any um, help, oh, never mind. Combat Wombat coming in big, getting a pick onto Nitro Galaxy and Kamski nice without that. Um, without those main heals right there from Kamski, is going to be very hard for Kennesaw State to stay in this fight especially since they've got both. But look at the double boot coming in from ISO! Trying to turn things around, Combat Wombat still on point, dealing a lot of damage. Everless comes in with the Meteor Strike as well. And Appalachian State just doing everything they can to hold on, but it's all gonna be for not as match. Finally takes um, a tr uh, trip back to spawn and that's gonna do it. Kennesaw State comes up with a map win on Nepal. That was, uh... 
that was a team fight. I, I'm just going to leave it at that. That was definitely a team fight. Uh, we had a bit of a, it seems like a disconnect issue from the off tank of Kennesaw. And regardless, ISO just decides, I got this. Let's drop this beat, get a couple <laughs> of boot kills and just hard carry the team fight. So we get the 100 zero. And again, Kennesaw is just in the driver's seat right now. You can tell from the way that they're playing, from the results of the two sub maps so far. It just doesn't seem like they've even broken a sweat at this point. No, it certainly doesn't. Kennesaw State just looking absolutely dominant right now. And, you know, I, I have to wonder if some of these ringers, you know, uh, some of these subs coming in are maybe throwing off Appalachian State maybe a little bit more than Kennesaw at the moment. Um, you know, and there's one notable name that we are missing tonight from Appalachian State, and that is Backstab Bud. They're not in the lineup tonight. Now, we knew that they weren't a part of the regular team, but I think having them missing is really affecting the gameplay. True. And I also believe that Kai, their starting yes. or rather, you know, a typical off tank that we saw in the previous match is not able to make it today as well. Um, those were two of definitely the highlights for me alongside their main tank, Dave, in that previous match. And yeah, again, it, it's Overwatch, right? It's a team game. And if everybody is playing at that high level, it opens up opportunities for other people. Right now, that's what's missing for App State. They need some kind of way to open it up these team fights because it seems like every single time they're just starting on the wrong foot because Kennesaw is one step ahead of them. Even when they lose an early member, they almost instantly come right back with a new game plan, throw a couple of ultimates in, take it back to the objective because they already have control of it. And it's an easy team fight win repeatedly for Kennesaw. So App State coming into this next map, they need to get themselves that opportunity to start fights off more consistently. That they do. And just a reminder, this is a first to two matchup. So if Appalachian State takes another L, they are out of this tournament. Their chances of going on to that land on November 6th evaporate. So they really need to turn this back around and bring something unexpected. And I'm curious to see what that's going to be. But before we mention that, I do also want to remind everybody that this has been sponsored by the U.S. Army. So big thank you to them for coming out and supporting this tournament in a huge way. And as a matter of fact, we've got a little special treat for you after the first match. We're going to have an interview with a member of the U.S. Army talking about uh, his experience in the Army and playing esports as well. So excited for that. But before we get there, we've got plenty more Overwatch to happen. And I'm excited to see what this next map is going to be. Me too. And uh, honestly, I'm really interested to see how App State tries to recover from a first mm -hmm. map like that, because again, we've seen them already. We've seen a lot of the different looks that they've provided. Six Man and uh, Rush was sort of their bread and butter in that previous match. And now right. both of those looks have fallen flat on their face, it feels like. So uh, maybe we're going to go towards something with more range involved, something that can allow App State to take longer ranged fights that will then get them picks in order to open up some of these fights. Because just starting things off here, um, when you're taking those rush v rush matchups and you're not able to sort of set up any sort of flank or take an early pick on a tank and snowball that into a team fight win, you have to find something different. And as you can see yes. from below, the beautiful text <laughs> below my face here, we're going to be going to Watchpoint Gibraltar, which is a very, very dive heavy map. Yes, it is. And, you know, I feel like this does play into Appalachian State's hands um, pretty well. Um, they mentioned last time that we played or that we casted for them that they really like the double bubble composition. And while that is kind of going out of style at the moment, it is still viable, especially if you're going someplace like Watchpoint Gibraltar. Very true. So again, going into this, App State needs to try to pivot away from those rush matchups and put themselves mm -hmm. in a better spot. This map choice is a great place to start with that. But again, like you talked about, I really don't know if Winston Zarya is going to be the answer here because a lot of these fights are just being decided by one of the tanks being blown up instantly. And Winston Zarya, yeah. sure, when you get those ults online, when you have that damage threat potential with a full charge Zarya, you're pretty threatening. But until that happens, I think it's going to be very easy for Kennesaw to actually just take control of these team fights like they've been doing consistently. So again, we're probably going to see something else. I'm looking at Winston Diva in particular particular and with a Winston Diva it gives you a lot more flexibility in some of these engages as well as peel potential so you can go flying right back to your back line if they need a Diva Matrix. Yeah that's such a good point you know that provides so much more peel I feel like for members of you know members of your team relative to a Zarya you know Zarya has that one bubble and once it's gone it's not back for another eight seconds whereas Diva in her defense matrix it recharges a lot faster and you can use it multiple times but starting things out, we do have a dive look coming in from both sides. So Appalachian State opting uh, to go for the Zarya, in, or rather the Diva instead of the Zarya this time around. 
And they've got a Mercy Pocket at Hanzo. Those arrows are going to be dealing a lot of damage. That's one shot to the body on a Tracer if it is damage boosted. You can see Lukewarm trying to hold down that cart, but it's getting pushed pretty aggressively by Abstate right now. Just going for a bit of a soft dive, trying to build up some ult charge. But in the meantime, Ooh. they've left out Winston, getting cut off from the LOS on heals there. That is a oh, nice opening pick for Kennesaw. Yeah, and there was a massive biotic grenade that came in from Kamski as well that allowed the picks to come through onto Effortless too. So. Excellent play from a lot of the team members of Kennesaw State right there. Um, Appalachian State, uh, they eventually, the Everless swaps over to the Soldier now. So they're foregoing all the L charges that they had previously built up for um, some more mobility and maybe a little bit more damage. And sustain as well. That heal pad is nothing to scoff at for peeling yeah. the back line. But again, I don't think it's really the issue here. It's really about the tanks getting blown up by the focusing beam from Watts. He's already at 70% on this copy. Luke's Worm's Ooh. gonna have this pulse bomb as well. These tanks need to be careful. Yeah, they certainly do. The fight is breaking out um, heavily on the point right now. But it's gonna be effortless getting the first pick and Watts is out of the fight without that um, damage coming in from so many different angles. It's gonna be a lot harder now for Kennesaw State to do what they need to do. But ISO comes in with another pick and the legs is out of the fight. And this cart has stalled pretty effectively now, just past the car wash. Kamsky drops the Nano onto Nitro Galaxy. He's gonna get this Primal Rage online and everybody in the back line of App State is quaking in their boots. He's going crazy <laughs> with these fists. Just flying towards the spawn door, it feels like he is not stopping. No, he is not. He's got Effortless um, picked out right now, takes him out of the fight and with that, um, Kennesaw State holds once again, and look at the ult bank they have too. They've got four coming up right now, and oh my gosh, that late pick on the Luna is just brutal. It's killer. I mean, he's just sitting there with 40% on his mech call like, guys, can you kill me now? I don't want to get rid of my bond. <laughs> Fortunately, Watts gives him that swift death, but again, this is just more time off the clock. That's two minutes and 15 seconds gone now for App State. Have yet to really put anything together, but they finally have six ultimates, which should allow them to walk up first. Yeah, it certainly should. Let's see if they can make that happen. Primal Rage popped now by Dave. Oh. They're going to dive onto that high ground, trying to take this Brig out of the fight. Um, but in the meantime, Luna has found a pick onto Prototyper via self-destruct. Rally committed now from ISO. That's going to allow Kennesaw State to push forward a lot more aggressively now. And that is exactly what they do. But there is a counter pick damn. both ways. So this fight is still even right now. Duplication out as well, or done now as a matter of fact. Combat Wombat takes another biotic grenade and they go very low and are forced out of the fight. And Kennesaw State holds and look at the ults that they made App State use. Basically everything except this tack visor, Effortless is gonna try to pop it at least sometime in this next team fight. But until that comes Ooh. out, oh my god, never mind. Nice one clip from Lukewarm there to just instantly shut out what I was saying. Does get res though, so the stack visor should soon follow. Luke's war Lukewarm's play has been red hot tonight so far on that tracer. They're just doing a tremendous amount of work. Speaking of tremendous amount of work, Nitro Galaxy once again with the primally Winston. He's trying to isolate as many of the members of the backline as he can. He's got the mercy on the ropes. Can he finish him off with the Tesla cannon? Not quite, but he effectively pushes them away long enough that App State doesn't really get heals and they aren't able to push that point until about now. App State needs to start taking tempo into their own hands. Luna's Diva bombs have been pretty nice in the past, but again, Dave is gone without even using the Primal Rage. So we're entering an overtime fight scenario and the Tac Visor comes out Ooh. as he dies. This is just really oh, no. Yeah, this is really, um, this is really not looking good for them. Overtime is starting to click over. They just barely made it halfway through first point. Luna does find a pick on the ISO, but the picks are still coming in way too heavily in favor of Kennesaw State. Although I say that and Wags is removed from the fight by an excellently placed pulse bomb from Combat Wombat, but is it gonna be enough? Lukewarm has this pulse bomb. They are able to find Luna. They stick it to the wall and they just walk right beside it. Everless doing as much as they can on point now to try and keep uh -oh. things alive. But Kamsky has committed that nano boost onto Nitro Galaxy and they're gonna be able to pop this Primal Rage right after it. And two picks come on the board now for Kennesaw State, but Appalachian State is still putting up a fight. How is they going? do not want to let this go. I mean, this is just the world's longest team fight in overtime, it feels like, but guess what? Kennesaw's on defense, App State's on attack. Your respawns are going to get very slow over time here. Kennesaw just has to close out a couple for 
And and that, there it is. I mean, the cart is stopped in such a rough spot as well, right? Like it's a yeah. full hold on first underneath that first bridge. That is not something you see very commonly. No, it's really not. And that's going to be such a hard pace, place to post up a defense. Um, you know, despite how well Kennesaw was able to do it, it's going to be an uphill battle for Appalachian State. Their backs are firmly against the wall right now. They have to come out with a map win right here or else their chances of going to that land on November 6th are out the window. So they're going to be pulling out all the stops. They're going to be pulling out everything they can to try and make this defensive hole work. I'm, uh, I'm looking into the future, peering into my crystal ball here. <laughs> See this going one of two ways. Either Ab State puts on the world's greatest defense on Watchpoint Gibraltar first that we have ever seen, or Kennesaw walks it in pretty easily. Because, I mean, the, the trends that we've seen so far in this match, I mean, Kennesaw has just had every opportunity to close out the fights, and they get it, and they do it consistently, whereas App State has a lot of openings that they're just failing to close the book on, it feels like. There was that moment where both of us were kind of harping on Effortless's tag visor, waiting for it to come out, and it just never does, and then eventually the opportunity passes. Kennesaw comes right back in with a nano-boosted Winston, and it fades, right? So App State yeah. needs to try to be more decisive on this defense without losing too many people behind them, or else they will not be able to hold this out. Yeah, that's a very good point, you know, and with, yeah, with such a large hill ahead of them, Appalachian State, the mental has to be really trying right now in the game. Wads does go over to this Echo once again, so not surprised to see that come out. Ooh, an in early engage and very aggressive one from Nitro Galaxy. Um, they do back up eventually, but they get some good ult charge off of that. They're going to be looking to dive this high ground once again to try and push Appalachian State off. But the cart has already been pushed very, very close to the victory line. And we can see it coming up very, very soon. Appalachian State going to have to drop soon if they hope to hold this. They do just that. Combat Wombat coming in with a stun from the uh, from the cowboy right there. Doesn't fight anybody, but it's Wads who's able to take Dave out of the fight. And without your main tank, it's going to be really hard to mount a... Um, successful defense right here. Dave swaps over to that Wrecking Ball to try and get back as fast as they can. Anti-Nade hits Combat Wombat. They're forced out of the fight. They go down very, very low and in fact are removed as well. And this is all but over right now. Just two members left on point for Appalachian State. Kennesaw can taste the victory. They can taste, they can see the trip to the finals here for the CNC Southeast Invitational. And that is exactly where they are going. Congratulations, Kennesaw State, on a fantastic and convincing win over Appalachian State. A much-deserved trip to the finals for the boys at Kennesaw. I, I really do feel like this is probably one of the better teams in the tournament. Just because, from watching App State's play yesterday, I felt like they were pretty decent, right? And then they come uh, into today's match, and, and Kennesaw is just destroying them, it feels like. Gets yeah. the first hold on first point of Watchpoint Gibraltar, 2-0 on Nepal. I mean, what more could you ask for on the winning side, right? <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. That was just a dominant performance from Kennesaw State. You know, the um, they, they just looked um, head and shoulders above Appalachian State in this matchup. There wasn't really much that it looked like Appalachian State could do to try and come out with a win right here. But... That, I think, speaks more to the fact that Kennesaw is just head and shoulders above some of the other competition that I think we've seen here. And whether it's USF or Clemson who ends up going up against them in the finals, it's going to be a tough matchup, I think. So excited to see um, how that's going to play out. Me too. And uh, fortunately, we will be able to get an interview quickly with yes. uh, one of the winning members on Kennesaw. So we're going to throw it to a quick break. We'll get them in the booth for you guys, and you'll be able to hear from that winning side. Don't go anywhere, and we'll be right back.
Hello, everybody, and we are back with our interview. Tonight, we have from the winning Kennesaw State, Luke Warm, the Red Hot Tracer player, uh, who we saw carry a lot of fights for um, Kennesaw State. How are you doing tonight? And congratulations. I'm doing great. How are you? Doing good, doing good. So um, to start things off, I just want to know, um, what kind of preparation do you all do for a tournament like this? You know, what goes into getting yourselves ready? Um, for a tournament because like you know from your from your record here especially as well in NACE and OWCC where you're doing well as well you all seem to be bringing your A game at, to every tournament um i mean all that really goes into it is playing a lot of scrims in like the off days where we don't have a million tournaments to play but uh i guess it's the reason that we may appear as like we're playing pretty well is because we have a lot of really good team synergy that you build up in those scrims. So right. it's like the more practice that you get with your team, I, especially as of recently, it's just like shown a major difference how I, we, we've been like performing. Yeah, I mean, it's very apparent just from, you know, I, I would say the skill disparity from quarterfinals to semifinals now and now as you enter finals it seems like you guys are just kind of on a different level with all that synergy you've been <laughs> discussing um going into tomorrow's uh finals match obviously you've locked in some kind of cash prize and i'm sure you're gunning for a spot at the land between the two teams that you might be facing is there a particular opponent you would rather face and as a reminder that's going to be either usf or clemson <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna keep it a buck with you I am not sure who we're facing or, or who's on each individual team. I'm going to keep it a buck okay. you. Okay. I've not done my research. I'm just kind of, you know, coasting. But, <laughs> uh, you know, preferably, I'm just going to say Clemson. You know, that sounds like a cooler, cooler team. You know, big fan of Clemson. Love the emblem. There's some, there's some brand recognition there for sure. I yeah, mean, I, I, yeah I, right. Um, I'd assume they'd have a, a better Overwatch team, but... Who knows? Yeah. Um, yeah, we will find out next. <laughs> that is for true, sure. True, true. We'll, we'll be getting to see them live in the next match, actually. And um, going into my second question, obviously, you talked a little bit before the match with Juggle about some of the compositions you felt the most comfortable with. Uh, you noted that your poke was what you felt was strongest. And while you didn't get the opportunity to show that off today, I would like to note that you guys did seem extremely comfortable in that dive mirror on Gibraltar. Uh, when you were playing Tracer there, what was sort of your keys to the game to have, making it easy for the rest of your team? So I'm going to be honest. What I said to my team 30 times before the match season started is I'm just going to sit on cart. I love pushing the cart. It's my favorite thing. I'm a cart <laughs> enthusiast. Pretty much, if you can pu uh, push on a uh, uh, tracer cart, it, it forces somebody to 1v1 you down. And because you're yep. getting that passive health from the cart, you can 1v1 anybody. So it forces more resources down while your team can take the high ground. It's very, it's kind of broken because like <laughs> tracer's health pool is very small. And the uh, regeneration that you get from the cart is more than enough for you to just live off of it. Mm -hmm. It's very good. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously you have like the health packs, you have blinks, recalls, tons of survivability, makes total sense. And it clearly worked, right? You got the dub. So. Yeah. Well, before we uh, close out this interview with you, I just wanted to know if you have any shout outs you'd like to give to anybody on your team, uh, family, friends, anything like that. Uh, I'd like to shout out Cam Sky because of that crazy play of the game at the end. He actually was... He was supposed <laughs> to be the one that interviewed, but he doesn't have a camera. So, oh, no, poor know, guy. I, yeah, shout him out. So, appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Cam Sky. Excellent play from you as well tonight and from everybody on Kennesaw State. Congratulations once again, Luke Warm, and uh, maybe seeing you for another interview tomorrow night. Best of luck in the finals to you and the rest of Kennesaw State. Thank you. You bet. And with that, we are going to throw it to a short break before our next semifinal match. But we do have a cool surprise for you in between each of these matches. We will be interviewing a member of the U.S. Army who also plays uh, lots of esports as well. <clears throat> We're going to be talking to Sergeant Anthony. So be sure to stick around for that. Sure to be an exciting and very interesting interview. But we will be right back. Don't go anywhere.
Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Thank you for sticking with us during a little bit of an extended break right there. But don't worry, we have our interview for you. We are going to be talking with uh, Sergeant Anthony about his experiences in the Army and esports. So first off, uh, welcome, Sergeant welcome, Anthony. Sergeant How, Anthony. Are How are you doing tonight? How are you doing tonight? How's it going? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, 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 you bet. Yeah, so you bet. this so is this is a really this exciting, is a really uh, exciting uh, opportunity, opportunity. I think you know not only because the U.S. Army is uh, sponsoring this, but we get to like hear from your experiences, right? Like what it is like being in the army and uh, being so involved in esports as well. But to start things off, I just want to hear a little bit about your time in the army. What has it been like? Okay, awesome. So my time in the army has been uh, it's been busy. Um, it has been busy, but it hasn't been a time where I've haven't I haven't been able to you know leave my leave my my some of my hobbies that I had growing up, which of course was gaming. Um, so it's been busy. A couple a couple of things overseas. A lot of, a lot of school. A lot of a lot of different friendships that I've been able to make. Um, a lot of networking and a lot of connects. Meeting the actual esports team themselves. Um, but it's been nice to continue to explore, travel, and take my gaming to different countries as well. So it's nice. Very nice. Yeah, that's yeah, that's, that's really that's cool. Really so, cool. tell me, where are some of the places that you've traveled um, in your time in the army? Okay, awesome. South Korea is definitely one of the ones that are my favorites. Um, I've also been over to, of course, Texas. You know, stateside, Florida. Mm -hmm. I've been through mm -hmm. Germany, United Kingdom, um, Ireland, of course, Afghanistan, Iraq, Kazakhstan, um, Australia, and Indonesia. My gosh, so many wow. places and. South Korea, I mean, that just jumps out to me as just an esports hub right there. So I imagine <laughs> your time there was uh, very um, interesting and likely had a little bit more of esports. Is that the case? Did you get a chance to uh, to relax and play a little bit while you were there? Absolutely, and and, and oh, you know, Overwatch is, is obviously one of the one of the main games that are played over in South Korea. So it's nice that we're kind of watching that now. You go to any of the gaming conventions and whatnot, and this is a game that is primarily played. Um, so it was nice to see. Uh, it's a different atmosphere watching everybody play. Um, it's very competitive, very competitive, and it, it's it's been it's been very exciting. I didn't get a chance to, to enter any com competitions while I was there, but watching them play this game and the way they they, they connect and cooperate, it, it was it was a good experience. Yeah, I bet that was. Amentus, I'm going to turn it over to you for some questions now. Sure thing. So you know, on that topic of esports and obviously being in uh, the U.S. Army. Uh, how does that sort of work? So what is your involvement in esports like, if you could take a moment to explain? Not a problem. So esports wise is the Army, Army's marketing team as well. We've got that over in Fort Knox where our esports team plays on, on regular platforms, Overwatch, Call of Duty. Um, we've got Rocket League teams as well that goes out and then engages with the community. Um, you can see them on Twitch as well at their, at their US Army esports um, page. Um, but it, it's nice to... It connects everybody, and even with um, different primarily changes stations and whatnot. When you go from one base to another, everybody stays connected through their gaming. Um, it's its own community within a community. Um, so it's nice to have that hobby. So when we're relaxing after a hard day of a lot of physicalities and a lot of physical training, you have this to come back and sit back with your team in our separate community within our community. Very interesting to hear, and I'm sure that now of all times with the, the pandemic going on, <laughs> that opportunity to connect with one another is more important than ever. And on a more personal level, what has your individual involvement with esports been like? What's your gaming background like? I noticed you talked a little bit about previously that was one of your main hobbies growing up. Was there anything you were competitively in involved in? Absolutely. So one of the more, one of the more competitive games that I began in was Halo. Uh, major League Gaming, mm -hmm. getting onto the Major League site. Um, Halo was definitely one of my major games that I played. Uh, moving up, it was Call of Duty. And ever since Call of Duty 4 and the mission all gillied up was one of the things that really stuck to me and had me locked in the Call of Duty. And it's actually one of the reasons why I joined the Army. Um, I have stayed on the Call of Duty side, competing in League, um, as well as helping and, and competing with our Tampa Esports teams here. Um, with different cooperative things we've done with the U.S. Army Esports as a, as, as a whole. Very interesting, Very interesting to hear. And it's awesome to see, uh, you know, that melding of both of those sides and obviously your personal experiences, how it all ties together. Makes total sense why you're such a big advocate of this kind of stuff. And it's really cool to see that. Yeah, it really, really is. Um, I wanted to ask one question because uh, I'm sure a lot of a lot of people who are watching right now would love to get this kind of information from you. Um, do you, okay? So actually, first off, since we are in the middle of an Overwatch match, do you play Overwatch? I don't play Overwatch. I you don't I try play Overwatch. Okay. Overwatch. Okay. I, I try to get into Overwatch. I really did. Um, but it was 
it's it's a different app. So I think that one game that I could say that would be very very relatively close would be Destiny. But Overwatch is a very fast paced mm, game. Mm-hmm. Um, I've stuck to my roots, and that's always been it's you know at this time right now it's been Call of Duty. Well, okay, so then I have a different question for you, um, because uh, you mentioned Halo initially, and one game that has been gaining a lot of steam recently has been Splitgate. Have you had a chance to check that one out yet? So I have Splitgate right now, and I it is. <laughs> I'm getting ready to transition and check it out. It's been a very big interest. I've been watching a lot of streams. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I'm interested. I'm interested. Very cool. Very cool. Well, um, that is that is fantastic. Um, One thing one thing that I think would be really interesting to hear, and you touched on this a little bit already in talking about, you know, how esports kind of brought you to the army. But what how where has the overlap been for you? now being in the army. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. So o- overlap wise, it's, it's, it, I think it comes down to time. Um, but to, be, to, to answer the question that in, in, in the direction that I think we're going, um, there's a lot of things that we see that really becomes like a, a spark of interest for us. And it really puts us onto the, why am I doing this? And why do I want to do this? Um, and I like, I like I like where gaming has us, and I like that I like the community. But in specific, um, I like the training. I like the the the, the honor, the honor, the, the loyalty, the the respect that comes from these different players that we play with on joysticks every single day. I want to be that person. So I think that's one of the things that really motivated me. If that answers your question, yeah, that really does. And to kind of like tie into that a little bit. Um, where can people go to find out more information about the U.S. Army and in particular esports within the U.S. Army? Are there Twitch channels, uh, Twitters that we should follow, anything like that? Absolutely. Um, so most definitely more information on esports is, is, is definitely at gourmet.com, of course. But in specific, there's a Discord channel. Um, the US, oh, USAE, oh. U.S. Army Esports, has their own Discord channel. And you can also follow them at Twitch TV slash, I believe it's USAE, USAE Esports as well. Very cool. So um, this Discord, is it open to the general public? Um, it is. There's, there's some small questions nice. I'm going to ask before you, go, before you go inside. Sure. Um, and, sure. They'll, and they'll approve you to go. But this is where the official esports is. So these players that are on the United States Army esports team, this is their job every single day. They are soldiers. They come from different backgrounds. We've got helicopter right. mechanics, right. infantrymen. Um, we've got different types of aviation mechanics, airborne soldier, air assault soldiers. Um, but they come out of their, their specific jobs to compete in specific levels due to their skill levels um, for approximately two to three years on rotation before going back to the regular job. But they get to do this every single day. And it's awesome. Wow. Wow. That is fantastic. What an, what an amazing opportunity uh, within the U.S. Army that I, I imagine many people here really didn't know about, uh, myself included. Uh, before we uh, close things out, uh, Amentus, did you have any final questions for Sergeant Anthony? Honestly, I feel like we've touched on most everything that we could <laughs> reliably get out of you. And I think we've taken <laughs> enough time out of your, I'm sure, very packed day. But just to close it out, is there anybody on that U.S. Army side? We love to do this kind of thing where we're like shouting out people at the end of interviews. Is there anybody you want to give a personal shout out to? <laughs> uh, I mean, absolutely. There's there's always going to be specific leaders that, we, that we, we've experienced in the past. They're awesome people. Um, currently, right now, I've got First Sergeant Turcotte. Um, my current company commander right now, Captain Dunlap, and all my friends in my station, Sergeant First Class Royal, Sergeant Cologne, Staff Sergeant Carranza. These are guys that I work with every single day, and we also play together on here. Um, it, 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 it's a community that we love to be a part of. So I really appreciate you guys having me on here. It's been awesome to be able to come and talk. Yes, yes. Um, thank you so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. You are welcome. A pleasure to have you on here and learn uh, learn a little bit more about you, uh, the U.S. Army and esports and how it all comes together. So thank you so much for taking your time, out, taking some time out of your day to come do this and wish you all the best of luck. And hopefully we'll be able to catch a game sometime that you're in. Awesome. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm ready for that. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, thank you so much, Sergeant Anthony. Um, and we've got a, a little bit of time before our next matchup that's going to come. Um, that's coming up once again. It's going to be USF versus Clemson, the semifinal game to see who's going to go up and face Kennesaw State in the grand finals tomorrow night. So be sure to stick around. That's going to start here in a little under 40 minutes, right at nine o'clock Eastern time. Uh, before we break, any final words from you, Amentus? 
Uh, looking forward to the second match of today. All the ones that we've witnessed so far have been one-sided, but at least on an initial read, I think this will be the most competitive match that we've gotten to cast at the very least. And uh, boy, oh boy, do they have some competition ahead of them. And I'm really excited to see who comes out on top. Same. Yeah, as am I. Well, we will be back shortly, everybody. Stick around, uh, you know, go go grab a little snack, uh, maybe play a few games or something. But be back here at 9 Eastern time because we will be ready to go for our final match between USF and Clemson. See you all soon. When you want to get off their darkest ground the gravity pulls you straight down Earth from a bird's eye view You should grow feathers and see this too When you want to get off their darkest ground The gravity pulls you
Hey, good afternoon, good evening, welcome. We're going to interview some really special guests today. Starting out first, will you introduce yourself, please? Stefan Lopez, Mary, uh, United States Army, sir. And where are you uh, out operating out of, or is that like, can we know that stuff, or? I usually operate at uh, Tamp uh, at Tampa, uh, near the Buck Stadium. Tell me a little bit about your history and how it came to be that you are a staff sergeant now. So yeah, a little bit of my history. So it came out, I'm originally from Puerto Rico. So I used to, you know, go to college and, you know, have a, have a job in a fast food restaurant down in Puerto Rico. So I was having some issues paying for college. So I decided at the age of 23 uh, to try it out. And I joined the, the U.S. Army for main purposes to go to college and pay for my college. And that was the, the, the main purpose why I started in the military, you know, and I was able to finish my degree in computer science. And now through and throughout throughout my military career, my first duty station was at El Paso, Texas, and then I worked with helicopters there, communications. And then after spending that there about four years, then I went and decided to go to Colorado Springs. So that's the place that I always wanted to go because people talk how beautiful Colorado is, which is it is. And I spent there about two years. I spent there two years with combat engineers, and then after that, I decided to become a recruiter. So I dropped my, what they call volunteer package saying, hey, I want to be a recruiter. And now currently I'm in Tampa, Florida, uh, trying to recruit personnel and teaching them about the Army and what can they do in the Army and how can they benefit of them with the Army. So my job and my role is, you know, to go out there and uh, either it could be social media, face-to-face uh, -face and teaching uh, high school students and college students and anybody that meets the basic qualifications uh, the benefits of the army and how can they benefit from our for what we offer for their personal goals. Uh, Staff Sergeant Lopez, we tell me more about what incentives are available for those high school, college, or anyone that could be potentially recruited into the army. One of the benefits that we harp on too much is when it comes down to tuition. You know, coming and being and specifically as a high school senior or if you're in college, you know, sometimes paying for it could come expensive. And but we do offer uh, tuition. Okay, we have what we call the GI Bill or the Post 911, which covers up to covers up your tuition. The good part about it is also is if you have it and you don't use it because while you're inside the military, you will also get extra money for college. You can use that GI Bill for your kids or your dependents. So in my example, mine I already paid for my degree. The army did, so I'm saving my GI Bill for my daughter once she grows up, so her college is taken care of. Outside of, uh, of course, of the GI Bill, you know, tuition for college, we also have medical, medical is covered for you and your family. And also you have dental, which is also covered for you and your family, your kid and your spouse. Also that a lot of people you know, don't know is you also get benefits. If you're married, your spouse uh, can have their her first degree paid for up to $4,000 for her degree. It's called my, my, my CAA. So there's benefits also for the spouse. Also, what we have, and a lot of people don't bring also the benefits you can use. We have over 150 career jobs, and you can pair up your career job with what you really want to do in real life. Uh, think about it as a long-term goal. What do you want to do in real life? Do you want to be in IT? If you want to do an IT, you mean you can actually afford the options in the Army and the IT and get your national certification because the Army offers national certifications, and we pay for them. All we ask for you is... Just take it. It's for free. Give it a shot. And once we pay for it and you pass the certification, it's completely yours. That's one of the biggest one also, national certifications. What are some of the other careers that you have just mentioned, you know, something common that people really want to get into? What, what are some of those great careers through the Army? Some of the, the careers, common options that we have, for example, one of them is mine. I'm IT communications. A lot of people like computers and they like the IT, working with routers, and that security plus. Also, you all have a lot of intel. Military intelligence people, you know, they come in military intelligence, they get that intelligence background, and they decide to go out for a federal government. It might be it might be the NSA, it might be the FBI. Also, what we see is uh, uh, agencies, military police, police officers. Some people like to uh, like to be a policeman, and they have problems, you know, trying to be in the Florida State Department. So they come in, they come in as a MP, military police. They do their, their their initial contracts and they get out. They have that veteran status and they get that experience and they go right into the state uh, for the State Department. Uh, so those are the comments. IT, military intelligence also. And then we have the MPs. 
those are the common denominators on uh, that what I see. Yeah, that's great. Let's uh, shift gears into uh, leadership and communication. Tell me what are some of the big uh, ways that you can learn about leadership and communication through the Army? That's one of the biggest ones that actually comes with our daily, daily job because you get promoted in the United States Army, and, and we're one of the fastest branches that get promoted. Okay, So once you start getting into leadership positions, right, that's what you do on a daily basis. You learn how to lead because now you, you're not only be assigned, you're not going to be taking care of yourself. You're going to be taking care of soldiers. And that's what we do in the military. We're called non-conditioned officers. That's our primary job. And it's our daily duties to make sure our soldiers are okay physically, mentally, financially. We also have to make sure their families are taken care of. Okay. And then we have to address those situations. So it's what we call our intangible benefits. Because we do that on a daily, daily basis. And then the good thing is that's well looked after outside the military because anybody that has a resume that's either an officer or an enlisted non-conditioned officer, they know by default you have that leadership skills. And it's a challenge. And it's a challenge. But we have to stop being complacent. And the Army takes you out of that mentality. You always have to learn new trades and you always can get better. And leadership will get you there because we do it literally on a day-to-day basis. Let's talk about what you learned in the Army and how that translates into your personal life and career. I approach it a different way. Just like, like I said, I started the interview. I always love, I love IT. I always love IT. And I said, you know what? I want, I want to be a good IT guy. I want to know about routers. I want to know about radios. So I decided to go to the to the IT route in the military, which has helped me a lot because I've been able to get my, uh, my certificate. I got my Security Plus, my A+, a plus, and then also my degree is in computer science. So that kind of translates to my life because when I, when I finished my military career at 20 years, I have that already, that resume built up of IT, having my national certifications in 20 years of experience. Uh, and it's also, and, and it helps me a lot too when it comes down to my family. You know, because the army teaches you not to be complacent, you know, and be thankful for what you got every day. I literally have a normal life from Monday to Friday, nine to five. After that, it's time with my family. I'm here in Florida, and I've already been to Disney a lot, a lot of times, and I'll keep going to Disney. Okay, so it helps me a lot with my family time because it helps me with time management. In the military, they teach you time management also. From this hour to this hour, you know, you're going to do physical exercise. From this hour to this hour, you're going to eat. From this hour to this hour, you're going to do your daily job. And I and I teach that at my house, put it in my house, my daughters, my family. It's like from this time to this time, you're going to, you know, uh, do homework. From this time to this time, you're going to work. And if you have any issues, you can bring it up from this time to this time. So that's how it t- technically translates to my military life. My, once they say always, oh, once a soldier, always a soldier. Well, Staff Sergeant Lopez, any last words you want to give to the uh, college students that are out there from the Southeast area or any of those watching live right now? Have fun in the tournament. And if you're watching me right now, all I can say is this. Take care of your future. Okay, It starts now. The biggest issue is the fear of the unknown. You use the military for your benefit. If you want to do something where it could be IT, military police, or you want to be an FBI, just Go to your nearest recruiting station and ask them, hey, I'm trying to I'm trying to be a military, uh, I'm trying to be a policeman. I'm trying to be in the I'm trying to work for the intelligence world. How can you help me achieve my long-term goal? Just ask him that. How can you help me achieve my long-term goal using the army? And trust me, you won't regret it. Well, Staff Sergeant Lopez, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you, sir. Thanks for your service to our country. No, thank you, sir.
Girl, I know you, know you, but you're everything I want in life. Yeah. We're fighting danger like kung fu. kung fu. The love I feel is deep inside. The others don't matter. matter. It's honestly us against the world. We're the perfect team. You're my dream, and I just want it. If you ever need a helper, hey, you should know that I'll be there day and night. Nobody else can love you better. I'm here just to treat you right. You're the reason I'm alive. You're the only pain I can endure. And when you're not here, you're my dream, but I just want it. Yeah, I just want to yeah. You're my dream, but I just want it. From the start, you my pony, I'm your clock From now to eternity, I give you all my heart We are meant to be, it's clear to see My love is bigger than I thought I got everything I want when I hold you with my arm Now there's no matter my love and my pleasure The key to my treasure, whatever's the weather Day up and out with you till I die How many times for you, I'ma try Want you to notice the one and I know this Perfect soulmate, I wanna show her my best friend She saved my life, my happy end in hard times <laughs> Thank you.
देंगे I'm on my own, broken and alone. I feel the rain crashing down. All around this empty town, I'm searching for the lost and found. But you don't care, you're unaware. Keep moving like the scars aren't even there. It's in the air, like a blazing flare.
shadows in the atmosphere charting the stratosphere i prayed for you and kept you near in hopes you'd chase away my fears i'm on my own you made it so and now i'm chasing nightmares i used to go with you through the great big leaves laughing at you when you laugh at me hope for us because i believe the home was just you and me i thought you were the one for me Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the broadcast. We are ready for the uh, next semifinal match between USF and Clemson. This is sure to be a fantastic one as well. Are you ready for it, Amentus? Absolutely. I hope both of these teams are not only ready for this match, but ready to face Kennesaw in the finals as yes. well. Because, again, we're in the semis here. The winner will go on to play Kennesaw, who, again, refresher for those that have not been able to wait for the last 50 minutes or just missed the first match. <laughs> Kennesaw came out ahead of App State 2-0, and the winner of this current match will play them in the grand finals for that spot at that land. Yeah, and this is going to be hotly contested, I am sure. We have two fantastic teams coming at you. Clemson Sports, two top 500 players, one of them uh, very recently a top 500 Genji uh, named Ami. So I'm going to be looking to them to pop off. And as well, a couple of players you can't really, uh, you can't you can't count out as well either. From USF, we've got Commander Huey and Bebop. Bebop, just a phenomenal diva player. So excited to see how these two teams clash up. Yeah, and uh, you know, coming into this match, we asked both of the teams a couple of questions regarding, hey, what do you like to play? Where do you think you're expecting to place in this tournament? USF told us that they expect themselves to get at least top three. So I guess technically they have made it this far. And in addition to that, they also told us they have a propensity for, like you mentioned, playing D.Va as well as May. So I would not be too surprised to see USF come out on a rush type composition. And as we go towards our first map of Busan, it'll be really interesting to see what Clemson comes out of the gate with as well. Because you know, Busan, to me, always struck me as a very rush dominant map type, but or rather a just a rush dominant map in general. But nowadays, I think Dive is equally as playable, if not better than Rush in a lot of cases. You know, that's a very good point. There's so much high ground that you can take advantage of, especially on downtown, where Dive yep. really um, starts to look appealing. And surprisingly, you can even play um, a composition kind of like that on Sanctuary as well. Uh, if you look to some kind of like a ball disruption composition, can work there too. Absolutely. <clears throat> and uh, obviously, you know, loading in our expectations, at least for me personally, are basically reset to zero. I have yet to you know, watch either of these two teams play. But regardless, they've made it to the semifinals. They made it through quarters to get here. So I am very sure that this will be a good match, uh, you know, relative to the last two ones that we got, <laughs> which were kind of one-sided. I'm really hoping for a more competitive one here. Yeah, as am I. The, uh, the you know, the USF versus UCF um, matchup that I got to see was a little bit more competitive. It still went 2-0 to zero in favor of USF, if my memory serves me correctly. Um, but, yeah, I think we're, I, I hope we're in for a close matchup here. And we're going to be going to downtown first. So that high ground that we were talking about is certainly going to come into play soon. Absolutely. And, uh, Interestingly enough, um, it does seem as if Clemson decides, no, we're just going to play Rush anyways. <laughs> and USF, <laughs> who comes in and says, hey, our diva in May is really good. Uh, no, they're playing Dive, which makes sense, right? Uh, Dirk the Turk, uh, particularly on Diva here, um, rather than Bebop, who was previously mentioned as that diva that we should be watching. So interesting to see those two tanks switching it up for this first sub-map of Busan. And already we can see USF has taken first control of the fight space. Clemson, starting on Rush, needs to find a way to access that back line quickly. Yeah, the Wrecking Ball already on point, shaking an off angle for USF, looking for some kind of disruption. We see him rolling through. Uh, Hack comes in from Saki as well, but there's not going to be any follow-up on the luck. Pile driver comes in and catches almost every single member of USF, and Bebop pays for it dearly with their life. 
Uh, USF now looking a little bit worse for the wear as Clemson comes away with this first point control. Not having your wrecking ball, although he is very close to mines and will get back quickly, might be rough for USF. Looks like he has made it back just in time. But now Jin's under a little bit of pressure from Omnion Tracer. Fire Strike from Saint, Saint Hista hits as well. He's got to kite this away until he gets the trank, but he goes Ooh. down. No major just comes in. <laughs> yeah, and without that transcendence for this next fight, USF is going to be uh, somewhat up the creek without a paddle. They do get the res off, though. Luluki coming in clutch right there. Omni not quite able to stop it from happening. Bob committed to point now, uh -oh. but it's gonna go straight <laughs> off the edge, unlucky. Um, but that's not stopping USF. They've got a couple of picks on the board now, and they should be able to turn this in their favor. Transcendence committed from Jin, keep his team up, and to keep the rest of this fight alive. And there it is, USF comes up with the point cap. Yeah, it looks like the first two exchanges kind of go as expected. Clemson doesn't force their hand. They take it to the objective, get that early point control. But against USF's comp, it's not going to last there for very long. So naturally, they do eventually end up giving it up. They don't have any ults to maintain that hold on the point. And now, Saki's got this EMP, and Classics is the only one on Clemson that's really suited to counter it. Gotta hide to get that sand barrier off as they rotate through. Yeah, ooh, Saki gets detected, but they're fine for the moment. The EMP comes in, it doesn't catch Classics out. Classics is able to use that sound barrier to keep Clemson alive and healthy. And now, they're going to be able to push towards this point, especially with Saki out of the fight. Amaterasu has the self-destruct ready to go. They're pushing Bebop out of the fight, but Jin gets an exit pick onto Lucky. Um, Amaterasu says, I don't want that to happen to anybody else, and pushes them off that high ground. Shatter! comes in from Saint, catching a few members of USF, but USF still holding on strong to this point. Looks like uh, Commander Hui just kind of drops in, sacrifices his life, but gets the bob out. Clemson loves playing inside of that little cubby hole on the point, and it ends up being their death trap because Bebop drops those mines, and there's just nowhere you can run after that. So USF, good job at countering out that push coming out from Clemson. Even when that initial EMP kind of went awry, it just forced out that beat so they didn't have that tool once they reached the point. Yeah, exactly. And without that beat to use to um, help them sustain, there was really not much that they could do on that point, just like you were saying. Clemson starting to push through to this mid ground right now, taking control of the tree area. But Luke finds a pick on the Saki as well. So now they're going to be able to push in quickly. Um, is the res going to come through? That is the question. Jin pops the transcendence now to keep a USF up on point Ooh. again. And Commander Huey with a fantastic shot. Headshot takes luck out of the fight. Self-destruct coming in now from Amaterasu. Doesn't find anybody, but it briefly clears the point. 99% on the board now for USF. If Clemson wants to come back in this, they've got to put the um, pressure on now. Commander Huey doing as much as they can to keep Omni in check right now, but they're back to the point. And uh, this fight just um, going on and on right now. Clemson like is the best CMP from Saki. Oh, has to translocate away with 25% HP left. Commander Huey throws out the bob to buy some more time on the point, trying to get Saki back in this fight to close it. Dirk oh. drops that bomb as well. That's a nice combo from USF. That that is, and USF is back in this with three members down now from Clemson. This is all about over, and this first sub map going to go to USF. Very interesting shakeout on this first sub map of Busan. Clemson, rather than playing a typical dive like you would see on downtown, like we discussed, they go towards that rush and just try to take a lot of objective control. But USF intelligently never really puts their swishy members in harm's way till they absolutely have to. You saw Jin on that Zenyatta consistently holding that little terrace above the objective, mm -hmm. maintaining those angles, those discords, those harmony orbs that entire time that Clemson was trying to take fights. And he almost never went down. He always had that pocket from Lulu Key. And I think that was the key to allowing USF to win that first sub map. Yeah, you're really right. You know, when Amaterasu was on that Diva, they were able to put some pressure on Jin. And whenever they did, <clears throat> it seemed to bode well for Clemson. So, you know, maybe that's what we need to see a little bit more of True. this time around. Amaterasu does swap back over to that Diva. So now we're going to see um, this classic rush composition again from Clemson. But USF opting for this Wrecking Ball disruption comp once again. Now USF has a far in the sky, and crucially, Clemson has sacrificed Lucio for Brigitte. Very difficult to proc Inspire into what USF is running if Bebop can deny it. Looks like Clemson is just trying to bunker up inside of the dojo here, wait for the point to unlock before pushing out, and there's really no good targets to go on except for the Wrecking Ball, so interesting to see this. Yeah, this is going to be a very tough um, 
situation that Clemson is going to find themselves in. They do find the Wrecking Ball, and they come away with point control as well. So this poke composition not able to get exactly what they needed. Commander Huey um, gunned out of the sky as well by the Cowboys. So this fight just goes handily in favor of Clemson. Great performance from Luck to force out that far consistently and allow the rest of Clemson, even without a Lucio, to rotate to the objective. Now on this recontest, USF does have a couple of ultimates mm. coming up, but they've lost the far or crucially again. Yeah, and you know, Luluki, I think, crucially wasn't there with the Farah during that whole time. They were instead pocketing Dirk the Turk on Diva. And I think that might have been a mistake as Omni just cleaned up for Clemson. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you need that far to have some kind of assistance up there, even though Clemson doesn't really have a lot of direct hit scan pressure. A cowboy is really all that it takes to force out a Farah, so you need to have that mercy basically attached at the hip. And as a direct result of some of these decisions, Clemson is sitting pretty at 50%, lots of ultimates on board, plenty of ways to take this next fight. Yeah, they certainly do, but they're gonna have to get through the transcendence of Jins. They either need to bait that out or find some way to get him off the board. That eye comes in, it's not gonna find anything, um, but it does clear the air a little bit for a moment or two. Pressure starting to be put on the pharmacy in the sky now by Amaterasu and Luck, but it's not gonna be enough to really do anything substantial. Um, Commander Huey does have this barrage online, could be critical in this next fight. Trying to look for time to drop it. Waits for the Diva Bomb. Goes for it. That's one. They can oh, get a second. Oh, yes, he will. Yes. The window from Camo Killer just not able to force that out. And that's three kills. Eventually, it feels like USF will get control. Yeah, but 75% on the board for Clemson. They have to be feeling very good about their position right now, especially after the last submap loss. Um, you know, it was looking very good for them during that map, but they weren't able to quite close it out and this time I think they're in a little bit better position to do so. Yeah, chiefly because of the Brig swap, I think once you get that rally online, you don't have to be concerned with hard countering this EMP. But in the meantime, this fight could be over very quickly if Saki hits all six members and Bebop can follow up. Yeah, let's see if it happens. Here comes the EMP and the self-destruct. The self-destruct was excellently placed. Um taking classics out of the fight. Bebop falls, but it's my probably not gonna be enough as the rest of USF is able to clean up what's left of Clemson. Yeah, it does feel like Bebop has been struggling a bit on this map, but not to the detriment of his team. The results are still showing it up, getting that first submap win, and on their way to a second, they've just got to get a couple more fight wins, string them together here. Uh, not having a big ult combo, though, might be rough for them. They have to play this slow enough until Commander Huey's poke either nets him that barrage or gets an opening pick. And in the meantime, Omni's trying to force the point, tries to get that uh, pulse bomb kill, but does not result in anything. No, it doesn't. And now Jin has this transcendence online as well. I imagine that was probably the primary target of Omni's. Hack comes in onto Saint. Doesn't do a whole lot at the moment, though. Um, as we see Commander Huey looking now for more value in the sky. They've got the barrage oh, to 80%. Is. They do find the opening pick as well, but Bebop falls too. Transcendence has to be committed as well as the Valkyrie. Both support ults being used by USF. The res does come in on the Bebop, but in the meantime, Commander Huey falls, and that's crucial because they had a Rocket Barrage ready and raring to go. Now it's all up to Clemson to try and retake this point, but Bebop has other ideas, as does his mind field. And this was a fantastic showing here from USF as they continue to clean up these staggers and take the first win on Busan. USF proving why slow and steady wins the race there, it feels like. You know, they give up a lot of initial control in those team fights to have that vice grip defense once they do eventually flip it back in their favor. And it was off the back of that Sombra play, it felt like. Once the EMP started coming online for USF, it felt like there was nothing that Clemson could do on the first fight that they would lose, right? USF would give up a lot of that percentage, up to 50, up to 75 on that second submap. But then once they get a flip, they get an EMP off, it's almost impossible for Clemson to not just reach that objective, but actually flip it back in their favor. Yeah, you're absolutely right. They weren't able to really find a crack in the armor that USF had once they got control of that point. And like you said, slow and steady wins the race, and that's exactly what that composition wants to do. It wants to take its time, build up ultimates, or find a pick or somebody out of position. And that's exactly what they did. They just took their time, and it paid dividends. 
what was what else what I noticed that was really interesting too was you know going from that first to second sub map uh, we saw a, a more normal I would say ash dive look coming out from mm. USF on that first map of uh, downtown then as we go towards sanctuary uh, they get a fara instead and then once you have your Brigida swap over from Lucio it's like well we were trying to hard counter that you know uh, half poke half dive style by the brig and then you lose your Lucio, so you can't rotate anywhere, and it just becomes that much harder to deal with far on retakes, right? So at yeah. some point there, it does feel like maybe Clemson could have gone for something different in the support lineup, but regardless, it didn't feel like they even had a chance in some of those fights. You know, that's a very good point. I mean, the Overwatch is a game of adaptation, and we didn't really see much from Clemson at you know in this first juncture. Maybe that'll change as we move on to our second map, but if it doesn't, USF might be headed to another quick victory as Clemson's back is now against the wall. This is, uh, they've, they've uh, yeah, they've got to do or die right now. They have to win this next map to stay in this tournament and try and make it to November 6th. That is the uh, the joy of first to two, right? You lose one <laughs> map and you are already in dire straits. So yeah. obviously going into this next map, I think Clemson is going to have a bit of a wake up call and maybe they can pivot towards something else that takes uh, USF away from dive. And while, yes, we yeah. can talk briefly about how USF feels comfortable on rush clearly by saying, hey, this guy's May is really good. Um, I, I think you could still try to go for a mirror there because... Obviously, Clemson is showing a propensity for uh, Rush as well. So going into our next map of Route 66, I don't really see this as the, the right choice for me because obviously USF, if they choose to go with defense first, can lock in basically whatever they want. They don't have to take that yeah. mirror and they might be able to comfortably play more Sombra, more Dive, get some uh, Wrecking Ball back in there. But regardless of what we end up seeing next, I do, I do think Clemson has to change something going into this next map. Yeah, they certainly do, because what they have put out so far clearly hasn't worked. There's been moments of brightness during it. There's been moments where we have seen it work. But overall, at the end of the day, you need to get to that 100 percent and 50 percent isn't going to cut it. And, you know, that's that's going to have to be either a change in composition. It's going to have to be a change in approach um, or it's just going to have to be. Uh, or it's going to have to be something completely brand new that we that we don't expect and that USF doesn't expect either. Exactly. And I think one of the greatest places to start when it comes to sort of making small tool changes over the course of a series is just swap like one or two heroes. You can keep the same general yes. play style, but maybe rather than having um, a cowboy, maybe you just totally mix it up and get like a Sombra in the mix to hard shut out that wrecking ball if that's what yeah. it feels like you're struggling with. But right now, I think it's about if Clemson can identify an individual aspect of what USF is throwing at them and then look to exploit that going into Route 66, because there is absolutely a lot of different things that you can play here. And there's a lot of different mm -hmm. ways you can play it as well. But the general name of the game is very slow cart push progress, right? You have to stay on that yes. objective a lot of the time. So maybe that's where Bat Brig comes in handy here. I could actually see that as a use case for this map. Yeah, that would be that would make a lot of sense. You could have them both really just bunker down on the cart or at least nearby it and then, you know, surrender the high ground to your tanks and your DPS to take care of what's up there, um, you know, because high ground is an important part of this map. You know, it, it's not Hollywood necessarily or New Brani or Gibraltar, but there is still high ground in this map and uh, you have to somehow contest you know, on top of that gas station, on top of Big Earl's, on top of the jail, on top of any of these points of Rig 66. And uh, some of the storylines that we kind of started up uh, on that previous map there was the kind of compositions that we would be seeing against one another. But I do want to shine some light on the individual performances we've seen so far. The supports yeah. of USF right now are playing out of their minds. Like, I'll just say it. That, that <laughs> Zen-Mercy combo yeah. throughout both of those first maps was pristine. Obviously, there was moments where the Mercy wasn't attached to the far, and that's forgivable, right? You got to heal your team sometimes. But overall, I would definitely say that we should look at the support line of USF as the rock for this team going into Route 66. Yeah, I think you're I think you're absolutely right. And interestingly, there is a sub on the support line, a big dinosaur coming in for Jin. Jin, maybe they were the Zen Yada specialist. I true, mean, their true. play on Zen was absolutely stellar. So I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. The Big Dinosaur is the name that I recognized from USF's previous game against UCF. So not surprised to see them come in. 
Interesting that they are deciding to start on this sort of uh, Mercy Baptiste look when it comes to poke because I like this option where you have that Mercy pocketing somebody on an off angle that'll allow them to play a lot more aggressively into what Clemson was running. Should they continue to go for that rush style, that would work very effectively. But obviously Clemson is on attack, right? Like they can scout this, get a good swap off and just play what USF is trying to do better. Maybe go for a Zen Baptiste and spam out the tanks, which will then allow them to rotate around. But right now, Clemson's pretty dead set on playing dive. Oh yeah, and Amateur's here coming in for a <laughs> row, but crucially, the accretion was there from Omino. So fantastic play from them. Uh, to keep that disruption from happening because that is the last thing you want to have happen. And there it uh -oh. is. The disruption comes in. Omni finishes off Saki after a fantastic pile driver from Amaterasu. Soup. And now USF is on the ground and presumably without a plan as well as the aggression continues to come in from Clemson. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Amaterasu gets rocked at the first time, but the second roll, uh, USF is not as lucky. Everybody gets sent careening off the edge of big girls. And Omni, who we've neglected to mention in this map so far, is on a signature Genji, and he just goes yep. off, right? That All that chaos works so well for a Genji where you can just be dashing back and forth, and you're not the center of attention. I think that's really key for Clemson here. They have so many different in-your-face threats with the Wrecking Ball Winston, as well as even the Cowboy from Luck. That's another off-angled threat that it's going to open things up for Omni in a big way in this way. You know, and uh, I'm glad you mentioned the Wrecking Ball Winston because this is a very aggressive composition. You typically see the Wrecking Ball Diva instead, which has more peel power. Yeah. So if USF can, you know, somehow get someone in their back line, oh my gosh, Emma Terasu just getting um, denied every single roll he wants to try and oh. take. Just getting, <laughs> and it happens again. But... Crucially, they're able to get the mines out onto that high ground and disrupt that bunker composition that USF had started to make. Here comes the dragon blade from Omni as well, and despite Saki getting a counter pick onto Camo Killer, this is just coming up Clemson right now. Though I may have to eat my words as USF is falling by the wayside now from what Clemson is throwing at them. Just like a couple tries, again, it's all about the repeated attempts from the Wrecking Ball of Clemson. Amaterasu is like, I'm just going to bait out every CC you have one by one until you can't do anything anymore. Uh, however, I don't think that's going to work on this team pit because USF now has ultimates available and they should be able to commit something to come out and touch this cart with, then use another to CC harder. Matarazzi gets stunned out immediately, but here comes the window. Oh yeah, and they're going to pay for it with their lives. Amaterasu goes down almost immediately. Classics reaches the end of their time before they even hit the ground from that gravitic flux. And USF comes up with a much needed fight win here at the very end of second point. They will stabilize, and I think this is where the double shield poke composition is going to have a huge advantage over Clemson. They can fan out in the opening parts of this fight to cover all angles, poke out the tanks that are trying to rotate through, as well as this backline of Honor Brig. Regardless, it really is about USF controlling these off angles, and right now they're not capable. Look at Amaterasu, he's already snuck behind. Oh yeah, he has, and look at that, Nox, Dirk the Turk right to the ground on that Arisa. Not where they want to be at all. Now they're going to have to spend precious time trying to get back up there. In the meantime, Saint goes in for a um, for a primal rage, trying to take luck out of the fight. Eventually, they do go down, but there's a couple of counter picks once again for USF. And now that there's a supercharger on the ground, there's so much damage coming in from USF that Clemson just can't handle it. And they're forced to back off and try again. An economic victory for USF there. Not a lot of ults committed, just that supercharger at the end, which in most players' opinions, I would definitely say is not a key ultimate in the double boat comp, just a little bit extra, <laughs> but nothing too big for it being gone, right? And now Clemson, I feel like they're kind of bottlenecked by this comp when it comes to ults. They're, raw, they're relying a lot on Nanoblade here, and Omni's getting shut out pretty hard, especially with Commander Hui swapping over to the Torbjorn. will be even harder to generate Ooh. that blade now. So Clemson, they're taking their time. They're trying to figure out, how do we want to attack this? What's our win condition? And right now I'm looking at a Nano dive on a Winston plus a Nade. And beyond that, it's going to be really difficult. Yeah, you're absolutely right. They do have these minefields, which they are going to commit early into this fight to start things out. Try to create a little bit of chaos. Omni is able to take Dirk the Turk out of the fight, so no main tank, no tank line at all for USF, as a matter of fact. So the DPS and supports are going to be very hard pressed to find life, um, especially with Omni on the prowl right now on this Genji, just doing tremendous work.
Uh, there's been so many comedic moments in this match so far. <laughs> uh, you had a Matarasu on Wrecking Ball just baiting out the CC. Omni staring down the barrel of the Cowboys high noon there. It's just like, I, I do feel this is a an interesting match to watch because now this has completely changed the tide from the first sub map, right? It was very USF yeah. dominant once they got control. And now with Double Shield, it's difficult to ascertain that again, right? They get that initial control maybe for five or 10 seconds and then comes in, comes in with the chaos. And now they've got another Nano Blade online to set it up once again. Yeah, this is gonna be critical, I think. The Nano Bleed is exactly what they need to win this off of. They only popped early though to get things started and there it comes. The Blade has been unleashed. Can he find any value? There's a big anti-nade in there onto Omni as well. But crucially, nobody can seem to find a shot onto him. There's no kills in the, um, in the works for Omni from that Nano Blade, but they do get a lot of progress and luck. Able to find Commander Huey on a uh, on a little adventure right there, take them out of the fight. Amaterasu now trying to get back into this, but they've gone down very low. Ominous Spy comes in with the Gravitic Fluxer to solo out Omni on that Nano Blade, and that is an ult exchange you would take any day of the week, right? They're committing a Nano and a Blade, and you just use that one ability to essentially completely shut it out. And with Lulu Key's Rally layered over top of that, there's no chance that Genji gets a single kill. Great counters from USF to recognize this is what Clemson is trying to do. But again, uh, I think there are some X factors with what Clemson does in this composition. When the tanks get ultimates, things get crazy on that objective. So we have to watch <laughs> stay closely with this Primal Rage. Yeah, that we certainly do. Amaterasu coming up with this minefield as well. If they can boop some people off of that high ground that USF has already got set up, then they can really open this fight up, especially with the Primal Rage coming online. But Commander Huey does have the Molten Core as well. Yeah, Amaterasu, they're looking, they're waiting, and there's the Primal Rage from Saint. Supercharger used as well. That has to be the primary target as soon as it's out. And it is removed from the fight. Lock and Omni though getting a couple of big picks. And Clemson looks as though they are going to roll through to a point completion here. Unless USF is able to mount some kind of stellar defense. But with DPS falling like they are, it's looking less and less likely. Oh, Clemson did lose Whoa. their supports early in that engage. And because of that, they don't have sustain to go the distance here. The respawns are going to come in for USF. Even with Classic swapping over to Lucio, it's not done yet. No, it certainly isn't. This hold now from USF has just turned to tremendously successful. The rally plus that Gravitic Flux is going to force the rest of Clemson to back away and try again. However, if you think about the one fight that USF used those two ultimates to get control back, that was into mm -hmm. Clemson's Nanoblade. And now Omni and Camo Killer 99 are rearing and ready to go on this likely last fight of third point on Route 66. Yeah, that they are. This is do or die now for Clemson and they know it. They've got this Nanoblade burning a hole in their pocket. We see Omni flanking over to the left side, trying to find purchase, trying to find a place to go. And here it is. It's gonna start right now. The boops come oh, no. in. Saki though finds two. Saki finds two with the um with the dead eye and a big dinosaur cleans up with the coalescence as well. USF looks as though they are gonna hold on to this defense at the last moment in Route 66. I mean, uh, sorry, classics, but why did you boop the one character that could shut out that entire combo? Oh my goodness, you gave that cowboy the high noon in midair to essentially push it away from Omni, who was trying to get close to him to get that kill. And it just uh, completely disrupts everything Clemson was trying to do. It feels like a bit of anti-synergy coming in from their own team, it feels like. And yeah. um, I, I feel like Clemson are going to be kicking themselves after that loss. Yeah, they certainly may be, especially because uh, now they know that USF only has to complete this map. Now, I say only, but that is a pretty <laughs> tall ask. None of these payload maps are easy to finish, but the finish line is set now for USF. They know what they need to do to take this home and get it to the grand finals. You know, there's an interesting dichotomy there, right? USF has the power in their hands, but they just as easily could let it slip through their fingers, right? The, the pressure yeah. is on. It's on them to close this out. They've bought themselves the opportunity to win this, and now it is just about putting two and two together and making it happen. USF going to start out, it looks like, on Double Bubble. Um, obviously, Omni coming in to play Genji, and I, I don't think he has any intent of stopping, regardless of what Kong's no. team is on. <laughs> it's been a bright spot for them so far. <laughs> But I do hope that there are other aspects of Clemson's comp that comes through here that can assist when the Nanoblade is not online. 
And Armaterasu on Zarya might be the answer. A huge damage threat at max charge. But comes in needs to get off on a good foot early in order to, you know, secure that charge and maintain it through multiple fights. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And if uh, Ominous Spy can get their charge up a little bit earlier off of, you know, this Winston dive right here, for example, then it's going to be really hard for USF to get anything done. But they're already down. The Saki. Ominous oh Spy, my. though, huge nade comes in. Ominous Spy taking advantage of it, as does Commander Huey. And USF is on a tear through this first um, point of Route 66. And they're not stopping. They're trying to walk it into the second point, it feels like. Eventually, <laughs> they're going to have to give up some control here. But great opening fight. Huge nade from a big dinosaur. Easy to see why he's coming in to play these two heroes, Baptiste and Ana. He's already making an impact on the first fight. Yeah, he certainly Again? is. Again? Um, Dirk of the Turk already almost has this primal rage online. Gigantic anti-nade again. Here it comes, the primal. Oh no, it gets taken out. Does it matter? What is there on the cowboy? You're right, it doesn't matter though, because the first point is captured in just as good of a time as we saw from Clemson. If not better. I mean, there wasn't even a moment yeah. where Clemson touched, right? Like they lost that initial fight off the nade. They have to come walking back through a tight choke as six. Another nade comes through and they're just shut out once more. Camo Killer 99 might have something to say about it though. He's like, I'm I'm trying to not get on a diff to your guys. I'll drop this <laughs> nano, maybe get my own nade. I think this really is a battle of the supports in this next fight. Yeah, it certainly, and it has been for a lot of this uh, game as well. Here comes the nano onto Omni once again. No, sorry, onto someone else it appears. The Shatter comes in from Saint, catches out a couple of members of USF, and they are going to fall under the pressure of Omni and Camo Killer and the rest of Clemson. You know, your initial read was right. They dropped that nano onto Omni, but he just chose not to pull out the blade, uh, trying to yeah. maintain it and maybe not rely so heavily on that ult combo. And I think it paid off. Saint layers in that Earth Shatter where, uh, you know, into what USF is running, it might not typically get as much value as you just saw it get. And uh, right. hopefully it doesn't because USF needs to find a way to deal with the main threat of Omni when he comes out with this Dragon Blade. Uh, Ominous Spy does have the grab, so he could use that to solo. Here it comes, though. Oh, yeah, let's see if it's going to find value. He's looking somewhere in the high ground. The Did grab is it? just... Yeah, I think the grab got deflected by oh, Omni my. over into just the right side of the map at the moment. Luck coming in with the Deadeye as well. And despite that anti-nade that came out onto so many members of Clemson, they clean up and hold. You know that meme where it's like my team's Genji versus the enemy team's Genji? Omni <laughs> is the enemy team's Genji. He goes for the dry blade, reflects the only way that USF could have won that fight, and it just doesn't even look like he cares. He just goes right back into murdering people. Like this guy's crazy on Genji. Very yeah. easy to see why he's coming into play for this map in particular. Now in this next fight, USF has to come up with a good way to push him away. They've got the rally, they've got the copy. How do they use them? Oh, they're going to copy the D.Va to start things out. That's going to deal a lot more damage into the shield of Saints. Going to make it very difficult for Clemson to try and hold any kind of a front line right now, especially with a self-destruct coming in and a rally, too. Self-destruct coming in from Amaterasu as well, and it does find a big dinosaur hiding behind the cart. So unfortunately, um, actually, this fight looks like it could go either way at this moment, but USF coming up a little bit ahead at the moment. Hack comes out onto Omni, and this may signal the end of this hold on second point for Clemson. Ominous Spy is such a bodyguard on this right side of the re-entrance. The Nano comes out of the Omni, but he doesn't have the blade yet. He has to find a good dash target to build it up, but the EMP comes in. Oh. There's nothing USF needs to do left. They just gotta close up these last kills. Yeah, that they do. The Shatter comes in from Saint, but it's not gonna find anything of value. And now USF is just tearing through what is left of Clemson via Commander Huey. Oh man, I mean, USF are playing pretty clean now. There was a moment yeah. there where Clemson looked like they had the vice grip on defense, but no, USF, they're like, yeah, we're fine. We're just going to take a reset, swap over to Sombra from Saki here. And it seems like it's changed the game. Once again, the Sombra from USF is making a huge difference in these team fights. And he's got another EMP, which could again, shut out Omni's Dragon Blade, which has been so helpful for Clemson in winning these fights. Yeah, it certainly has been. I mean, in some cases, it has been their only win condition. And look at this. I mean, USF has five ultimates online yep. coming into this fight. Skaki looking for the prime opportunity to use this EMP. We see Winston is already in the fight. Luck goes down low. Removed. Dirk the Turk eats a biotic grenade. 
but they've got the Primal Rage to stay alive. And with this tr tremendous aggression coming in from USF, it looks like it's almost over for Clemson. They've got to come back and stall out this point. But EMP. with the EMP, Netflix is looking even less likely. Kubuki does kind of kill onto Classics. There are a couple of counter picks, so it is 3v3 right now in the Spawn advantage does favor Clemson, but the game is favoring USF right now, and they are just moments away from victory and taking respawns. this to the grand finals to face Kennesaw. Wow. And that's exactly what we're going to see. USF comes in with a 2-0 victory over Clemson. I'll admit it. I didn't want this to be one-sided, and it really wasn't. I think Clemson put up no, a it great wasn't. fight in some they moments. Did. But man, yeah. am I glad that we got to see USF pull up that Sombra once again and use it to pilot the team to victory. Obviously, Omni popped off on Genji when he had the opportunity to. But once USF makes that Sombra swap, what do you do as Genji? You have no yeah. way of disrupting individual hacks. The EMP is always going to try to disrupt your ult combos. Just such mm -hmm. a forward-thinking heads-up swap from USF to close it out. And they absolutely deserve to make it to finals. Yeah. And you know what? Adaptation. Once again, we saw it come into play, right? Um, USF made the swaps. They made the adaptations. They saw that Clemson was doing a good job of holding them, and they figured out what the key to the puzzle was and solved it. So kudos to them, and can't wait to see the grand finals tomorrow between USF and Kennesaw State. I think this is going to be a fantastic match because uh, both teams are looking pretty strong coming out of these semifinals. Absolutely. And I don't want to make any, you know, initial predictions in one way or the other. All I'll say is there's two very different stylistic teams that we have on our hands here. We've got one side that loves to play dive. The other one kind of shies away from it. And, and yeah. fascinatingly enough, both of them have been, you know, telling us that they can play double shield, right? They come out of the gates here on USF side with that double yes. shield look. And while it wasn't too successful, I'd say, you know, holding on third is nothing to scoff at. But still, right. um, I think both of the teams in the finals are going to be very interesting to watch and see how they change throughout the course of the series to adapt to their opponents. So very excited to see that coming up. And um, overall, what a great match to close out the day on for the Overwatch side of things. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We are going to have an interview coming up very soon, but we're going to throw it to a short break um, before that. And stick around, because even after the interview, we have the semifinals for Rocket League starting. Um, two fantastic casters coming in, Lars Newt and Chef Billy. So stick around for that as well. But don't go anywhere, because we will be back very soon with an interview. Points in blaming you, you did not know oh. I thought you were the one for me That's why I give you everything Out of you cross by the stormy seas Oh, you meant the world to me
Hello, everybody, and welcome back. We have from USF, the one, the only, the ominous spy joining us for our interview today. First off, congratulations on a job well done today. And um, to start things off, I wanted to know, uh, Ominous, did you all have any specific um, way that you prepared coming into this semifinal matchup? Uh, definitely, we. Uh, I think we said it last time, we've upped our scrim schedule quite a bit. And we're like scrimming almost every day a week, if not every other, wow. trying to um, just go against uh, high teams, trying to get our like our comps down for these maps and trying to make sure like we have a set comp that we want for like each of these maps to like just have a general idea before we go in. Gotcha. Yeah, it really looked like you knew what you were doing on every map and that you had a plan each time. That was that was very, very clear. You all knew what you were doing and you executed it very well. Mm -hmm. So uh, first question for me is going to be uh, just something that I noticed watching the first maps. Uh, obviously you weren't playing on Busan and then you came into play Route 66. What's that experience like being on a bit of a deeper, a larger roster where subs happen frequently? Honestly, I perfectly, I love it because we're like, when you're in spectating, you're able to like kind of sit back and see, oh, what are our comms, who's calling what? And at the end, you're definitely able to like um, evaluate, oh yeah, this person was calling uh, really good here. And then if not, like, oh, we needed to be on the back line and watch like our healers getting peeled for and whatnot, which is, I think it's really good to just have that team coordination in there after. Yeah, that interesting sort of, uh, you know, accountability that gets provided when you have two people that play that same role <clears throat> watching each other. Very interesting point to bring up. And uh, uh, next question for me will be involving you, how you played on Route 66. Um, I saw you come in, you were starting out on that Sigma and obviously you see Omni on Genji on that other team who, according to Clemson, they purport to be a really good Genji player, and you lose yeah. to a couple Nano Blades. What was sort of your strategy for dealing with that, either personally or as a team? Uh, we were definitely alt-tracking, like, the Nano Blades, because that's obviously, like, one of the most, like, deadly combos in the game. So we would either, like, know we had like, a Rally coming up or, like, Sig Flux, and, like, try to coordinate, oh, we only use, like, this one ult for this, or, like, so we don't overcommit to the uh rally i know like on the very last fight like we didn't have anything for him we were kind of like uh nervous but i was able to get like that one rock off on them and we nice. had our kree in the back with the high noon ready for it yeah it was really impressive to watch that last fight with the high noon it was super exciting to watch <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that it was. Well, uh, before we close things out, I just want to know if you've got anybody you want to give a shout out to on your team, family, friends, anybody you would like, uh, you know, who's helped you get to the point where you all are at. Honestly, like, I can't pick just one person on my team. Like, we're, they're all, like, just so helpful, like, in just trying to narrow down our strategy and, like, just calming and, like, you know, just all all around just helping each other, like, um, learns from that. If that be, like, our other tanks, uh, like, trying to teach each other, like, how to play, like, another tank. Or, like, our other supports trying to teach others to learn their, their certain support. And it's, like, the whole team's just honestly been so helpful with just learning these uh, strategies before we go into games. That's fantastic. And it's great to hear that it's always a team effort. I mean, that's the name of the game in Overwatch, right? Um the, uh, the more solid and well that your team works together, the better you're all going to perform. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for coming in for an interview with us. Uh, I'm going to spy. Really appreciate it. Congratulations mm -hmm. again, and good luck to you tomorrow when you face off against Kennesaw State in the finals. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You are welcome. And that's going to do it from us here in the casting booth tonight. We are going to be handing the reins off to Loris Newt and Shelf Billy for Rocket League. So be sure to tune in for that. We've got the semifinal matches coming up and possibly the finals as well. Remains to be seen if there's going to be enough time for all of it. But before we go, any final words from you, Amentus? Nothing except many thanks, <laughs> not only to <laughs> you for pulling me back in to do this event with you, but just everybody at CENC Southeast, obviously US Army Esports for putting on this event and sponsoring it. Just uh, such a pleasure to come back in and cast for a really talented group of collegiate players and just being involved in the collegiate scene as a whole, I think is really important to keeping Overwatch alive going into Overwatch too. So shout out to everybody. Thank you so much for letting us come in and do this cast and I really appreciate it. 
All right, that's going to do it from us. Thank you all so much for tuning in, and be sure to stay tuned for the Rocket League that's coming up next. But from us here in the booth, booth GG's, and see you next time. GG's.
All right, so we got a very special guest, Staff Sergeant Mastin. How are you, sir? I'm good, sir. How are you doing today? I'm wonderful. So tell us a little about yourself and what you do now in the Army. Uh, so right now, uh, Staff Sergeant Mastin, like you said, uh, I'm currently 29 years old. I recruit out here in Tampa. I'm a part of the virtual recruiting team, and basically what we do here is we, we pretty much help um, the recruiters around Florida, wherever it may be, uh, do social media prospecting, do Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, Google, you name it. If it's social media, we're a part of it. So that's kind of what I do right now. I've been in the Army for 11 years. I love it. My primary job, aside from aside from recruiting, is a photographer slash videographer. So many people don't even know that the Army has that to offer. So that is my actual job in the Army. I take pictures and videos for a living. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much my short little story. Well, that's really cool because I know a lot of these – gamers, these students, these college students who are watching right now, a lot of them will make their own videos for their own brand content or whatever to be mm -hmm. recruited in college space or professional. Um, it's interesting you talk about Tampa because Tampa, that's a really hot spot for gaming. And there is a lot of re uh, events happening out there in Tampa that are recruitable. So uh, options for students to come and see from what you guys have going on. And do you have like uh, trucks or climbing walls that you take out to events ever? Oh, yes, sir. So we do have the gaming trucks available. Uh, we use those every now and then. Uh, at the virtual recruiting area, we don't uh, use them as much as they would at the at the recruiting level. Uh, we kind of facilitate actually getting the gaming trucks to the recruiters so that they can use it. And we kind of do everything on the back end. So uh, let's say a recruiter would play a game with somebody, then we kind of take that footage and we use it to, you know, blast it over social media, things like that. Just try to get everybody aware of uh, what's going on in the Army. Now, do you think uh, that you said in a pre-interview, you talked a little about you played a little Call of Duty back in the day. Do you think something like video games is beneficial for hand-eye coordination or dexterity for those joining the military in different career fields? That's actually a very good question. Uh, when it comes to hand-eye coordination, I do believe video games do help a lot in that area because you get a – a kind of sense of what to kind of expect. I don't want to say the Army, obviously, it's not a video game. There's going to be some realistic aspects you're going to get when you're in the Army that you can't get from a video game. But as far as, like, movements and things like that, especially when you're playing, like, shooting games and things like that, uh, those can have a very big impact on the things that you could see once you get in the Army. Because I know even they, they got the new, uh, was it Call of Duty, um, Modern Warfare, they got the, the guys come in, they do airborne jumps into the to the battlefield, things like that. They, those are things that you could actually do in the Army. I'm airborne myself, so I've had the luxury of jumping out of planes over 60 times. So, yes, those things that you see in the video game, you could actually do them a uh, large part in the Army. So I do believe, yes, it, it actually it works wonders with hand-eye coordination and uh, a bunch of different realistic uh, aspects. Wow, jumping out of a plane 60 times. That's amazing. So let's let us sure. use that. Um, jumping into the Army. I mean, what, what did it take for you to make that commitment at a younger age? Uh, so for me, sir, uh, coming to the Army, I, I decided at the last minute, I was 18 years old. I was about to graduate from high school uh, in Tennessee, and I really didn't know what I wanted to do. So, And I know that I wanted to start making money, and I know at the time, I didn't want to necessarily go to college because you go to college, then you have to worry about paying for it. Then you have to worry about a plethora of other things. And I, I just didn't want that. I didn't want to put that on my family. So at the last minute, I believe three weeks before I was going to uh, graduate, my recruiter walked in. I talked to him. I said, hey, man, I'm, I'm, I'm finally interested. I've been seeing you around the school for months. I think I want to kind of talk to you, you know. So I sat down and talked to him. I believe within like two weeks later, I was in the Army. So it, it kind of happened fast for me. And ever since then, uh, I wouldn't trade it for the world. So, yeah. 
So you're in the Airborne, and you were doing a video and photography. What other careers and other types of um, deployments uh, are there for the Army that you usually talk to students in the high school and college space about the Army? Uh, I mean, as far as deployments, that's all depending on where you're assigned and where you're located. It just depends. I mean, for me personally, I've deployed to Afghanistan. I've also had missions to Bahrain and Kuwait um, as well. Those are combat support operations, but they're not necessarily front line, you know, uh, on your job. So it, it just depends on the unit. Um, not everybody's going to have the same experience as far as deployments, especially with the drawdown. So, um, but I can say if, if you're interested or if you've ever um, thought about, you know, partaking in defense of this nation and wanted to go overseas to serve a greater good, I would definitely recommend the, the Army by far. And then what careers then would you, uh, what would you tell students that there are options are available for, uh, whether they're staying in the States or being deployed? So as far as careers, I mean, uh, pretty much every career that I know of in the military would provide you an opportunity to deploy. Now, certain career fields obviously, career fields obviously are more uh, susceptible to deploying. For instance, my job, um, you know, we document the battlefield. So taking pictures, documenting the battlefield, there's only so much you can do at home. So if you're interested in like visual, graphic design, photography, videography, that's that's an avenue. Uh, as well as infantrymen, obviously infantrymen, they, they do their job a lot uh, overseas as well. So every job in the Army has the ability to deploy. It just kind of depends on that person, what they want to do, how how willing are they to deploy. Because like I said, if you pick a combat arms jobs, uh, job, your likelihood of deploying increases versus, per se, a support MOS or a job, and that, that likelihood goes down. So did you have a knack for audio video or um, you know, photography and biography in high school, or is it something you learned or, or just honed in better through the Army? No, sir. So before I joined the Army, I knew nothing about photography. So it was all new to me. When I went to my recruiter, uh, I took my, my ASVAB, it was the, the test we take. I scored pretty good on the ASVAB, and my recruiter was like, hey, this job popped up, and it was for photography. And at the time, I said, the Army has photographers like me that how they don't but then i started thinking about it i'm like okay there are images and videos and stuff from all these different operations it made sense to me so once i found out that that it was an option that's when i kind of you know started to um look more into the uh, photography and videography and then once i actually photography it just opened my eyes up to a lot of things i, I think that in life in general you just kind of get fixated on what is in front of you. And photography has allowed me to to view the world through the lens of photography as well as broaden my horizon as far as what I think and what I see because the image can tell, you know, it can tell a thousand stories with one photo. So that it kind of opened my eyes up as well as with the traveling uh, opportunities. I've been to so many different countries. So it just, it just made me a better overall person. That's great. So, Staff Sergeant Mason, tell me, lastly, anything you'd want to tell the students out here that are watching live on the stream right now or that may w watch this in the future. If, if you've ever thought about joining the Army um, or not thought about joining the Army, I would definitely at least take a look into it because you don't know unless you try it. At least take the practice test. At least see which jobs are available to you because you never know what stands out to you that you may have never heard about. Like I said, I joined the Army. I'm a photographer. Uh, I didn't know photography existed. There's over 150 different jobs in the Army, so one may stand out to you that you like. You never know. If you would have asked me when I was a junior, freshman in high school, or even, you know, the first part of my senior year, would I have been in the Army for 11 years? I probably would have told you no, but look at me now. 11 years in the Army, plan on doing the whole 20, so, hey, sky's the limit. Well, Staff Sergeant Mastin, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for your time, and thank you for your service. Thank you, sir. You have a good one.
It's just like, man, you gotta have that time where you just like disconnect from the, from the scene, just the, the, the race. Like, and, and it's a race that I've created in my head, you know? But you have to step away from it.
Okay, welcome. Hello. Can you tell me your name and your rank and what you are doing here today? Good afternoon. My name is Sergeant First Class Potts here in Tampa. And I'm just here to give a little insight on my experience with the United States Army. Now, how long have you been at the station you're at right now? So today is my first day here in Tampa, but I've been with the Army for a little over 15 years now. Wow, 15 years. So what have you been doing all those 15 years? <laughs> I started off doing IT in 06. I did a little traveling, a couple different areas, and then I ended up transitioning to the Army Reserve. Uh, where I went to school here in Central Florida, where I'm originally from. And then I came back to active duty, where I work for the Army as a recruiter now. So in those 15 years, you were doing stuff around IT. Was there, mm -hmm. is there ever a time in your life where video games were a part of your life? Always. <laughs> I've always played video games. I still do, not as much, but uh, I definitely still enjoy them when I, when I get to time. What are some video games that you like, or some that are some pastime, or ones you play now? My first love as far as like, computer games like after Nintendo's, PlayStation, things like that. Uh, I enjoyed Red Alert, uh, like 97, 95. I like the Command & Conquer series. I like StarCraft, Brood War. Uh, I played a ton of Diablo 2. I also transitioned over to World of Warcraft in 04. I played that until I joined in 06, and then came like the Burning Crusade, so on and so forth. I kind of dabbled at the beginning of every like, expansion and then went off. And then uh, another one I really enjoy, Counter-Strike, always. You know, 1.3, 1. 1.6, Source, CSGO, a little iffy, but I'll still dabble in it on occasion. Currently, since I just moved here, uh, I'm kind of excited to play the remastered of Diablo 2. But outside of that, just kind of hang out and play whatever the boys are playing. Well, it sounds like we have a very similar past of Red Alert, <laughs> Command & Conquer, okay. Uh, the addiction of World of Warcraft. Uh, how mm -hmm. how is playing CSGO uh, really tie into what you've learned in the Army? Moderation is key with most things, right? Uh, I would say the Army has given me the confidence, the confidence, and just the overall motivation to be successful or to know what I want and make that decision. So like, if there's a video game or if there's something that I want to be good at, I understand that it's going to take time and effort and just be patient, you know, don't blow it out of con control or nerd rage on anything crazy. Just take things into perspective and, it, and it's vice versa. And my moderation is key. And I get that from, from video games and from the army. What are some incentives that you were able to participate in and also tell these recruitable uh, young men and women of uh, now? It, it really depends on what you're looking for. It's kind of, you don't want to give a blanket answer as far as like tuition assistance or college. Look at different programs. If you're a med student, if you want to be an orthopedic surgeon, if you want to be a veterinarian, if you're looking for higher educations and means to supplement the cost, uh, the Army is a legit way to do that. If you're looking for excitement or you're looking for something out of the norm or you just want to break up the monotony of whatever you're doing, you can do that too. You can do part-time. You can use it as another retirement, TSPs, Roth IRAs, things like that. Like Kind of diversify your portfolio and know what you're looking for. Do the research. The Army's there. You just got to come talk to somebody, have that conversation. Keep talking to more people. You know, one person's not always going to have all the answers that you're looking for. What, what are some things that you've learned that you want to pass on and hopefully they will learn as well? The biggest thing for me that I've learned is just being able to listen to people and, you know, put yourself in like a different perspective and take what you can from those around you. And the Army being as diverse as it, as it is, it's a melting pot with all types of culturals and us moving frequently and things like that. And when I say frequently, it's every couple of years or so, but you get to engage and interact with a multitude of people as well as like foreign nations. If you're, if you're doing some sort of like joint operation or just training, just, just having fun talking to people. And I think that's the biggest thing for me is just being able to, to communicate. You can guide and mentor, but ultimately it's that individual's decision, right? You get skills in the sense to provide purpose, motivation, and direction, but ultimately you're influencing that, right? So you need to have their best interest in mind and have that knowledge of what they're seeking because they're going to tell you and you're, you're ultimately helping them to get to that goal. That's really what I take from it, right? You don't make decisions for people, you influence it. So what has joining the Army all these years ago, what has it afforded you in your everyday life uh, outside of the Army? Well, <laughs> I just purchased my first home, so that's a big plus. I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, it's given me the opportunity to engage with those people as well as travel the world. Uh, I've been to quite a few countries, and I've been to name them all. 
I like to snowboard. I like to video game. It's paid for new computers. It's paid for new vehicles. Uh, it's just given me the, the opportunity and the exposure to do well for myself in my eyes. You know, you, you define what your own success is. And it's given me that opportunity to where I'm happy with my position in life. Well, awesome. Is there anything else you would like to tell any of the students or the players watching on this live stream that's happening or anyone that could be watching this in the future? I would say best of luck to everybody. And uh, if you guys ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. We're always here. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you and I appreciate your service. Thank you so much. No worries. Thank you for the opportunity, sir. Have a great day.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to CENC. We had a lot of fun with Overwatch, but now we're moving on to Rocket League. I'm Lars Newt. Joining me here in the casting booth is Billy for our first matchup of the evening semifinals in our Southeast Invitational Virtual LAN Qualifier. UCF Knights versus Clemson Purple. And Chef Billy, you know how we got to start all casts every single time. Thoughts, questions, concerns, comments, hopes, and or dreams. Whew, concerns right now for Clemson Purple. Uh, holding midfield. Uh, in their qualifier or in their quarterfinal, they won three to one uh, over College of Charleston. Boy, did they have a stinging midfield pressure. They really maintained presence in the attacking third, almost 75% of the entire series. They did win it three to one. So they did go down a game to kind of take their foot off the pedal in game number three and let College of Charleston get a little bit of a sniff, uh, being led by Brody and uh, T-Rath. Let me tell you what, T-Rath is going to be the magician out of the midfield, trying to set up Snipes and Brody. Uh, they are a dynamic duo that are really trying to set up the one-two give-and-go operations uh, in the attacking third. Now, UCF, of course, they are the RSC. They are qualifying right now for RLCS in their own little region now. So, uh, you know, there might be a bit of a skill gap here. However, there is maybe a little bit of a revenge bend <clears> as uh, the Academy team took down Clemson Orange in the round of 16. So this might be a chance for Purple to take down the behemoth that is the UCF Knights. But it's going to be a tall order for them. I think UCF has to really make sure that they 
really accelerate right out the gate. They don't, you know, kind of meme around and, and play with their food. Get out there, go for the stranglehold, get their offensive rotations going, and be solid on the back line. Yeah, I've seen lots of teams come out with tons of confidence only to get smacked in the mouth and kind of get, um, for lack of a better term, put in their place by teams that were <laughs> underdogs, but came out with passion and fire. So it'll be interesting going forward, seeing how that one works out. The one thing to note, <clears throat> excuse me, is UCF is already qualified for the land. They were one of the teams that was invited. So they don't have to win this Invitational to get their way into the land. This is more just for the money at this point. So it'd be really nice to see Clemson Purple, who has not been invited, who has to actually qualify through these tournaments, find a way to take down this UCF team, get into that qualifier, excuse me, get into the get into the money and qualify for this land tournament. It'd be great to see them kind of work their way through this process. But the only way to find out how is to get on the pitch. we got the teams in the lobby. We're ready to rock and roll here, put five minutes on the clock and watch them duke it out. Yeah, and I mean, what I'm looking for right now, you know, Clemson Purple, they had the holding midfield. They were able to really stymie any kind of pressure coming out of the defensive third. So what I want to see is can they continue this against a upper echelon team as in the UCF Knights? So, so mm -hmm. we'll see uh, if they can slow down. I mean, especially Asfra. Asfra is an all-field player all over the pit. So you know, we'll see them. And we'll see them going up to aerials all the time and they had aerial dominance in their uh three nil win over kennesaw in the quarterfinals so we'll see uh what they bring out the gate snipes in a blue decal on the orange team I, not making it easy for us over here ucf knights represented by bulby asfira and santi santi correct me whatever that is before i embarrass myself too much clemson purple t-rat snipes and brody Pressure at midfield. Santi following through. Looking for 